Welcome. My name is Leandro Nogueira. I'm the lead pastor here. So glad you came. So glad you're with us this morning. If you are visiting us for the first time, you heard it earlier, there's lunch. So stay for lunch. Even if you don't want to stay for the meeting, you stay for lunch. It's going to be good food. And, uh, but also, uh, don't forget to stop by our welcome kiosk right outside our worship center here. Get some information about us and how um, the church uh, operates and some of the things we have going on, some of the things uh, we believe and how you can get involved so you can do that as well. We have been on a series on the attributes of God over the past few weeks, and today we will be talking about God's love. And love is a word that is a part of our daily vocabulary, isn't it? I wonder how many times, even today, you have used the word love this morning before coming to church. Right before I I left the house, I told Isabella, honey, I love you. And I was leaving, and and Anna says, daddy, how about a kiss? And I went back to her room, and and I said, bye-bye, sweetie, I love you. And, And she goes, I love you too. Maybe you started your day with a hot cup of coffee. And you couldn't help, but after the first sip, you went, oh, how I love coffee. (laughs) Oh. I have a theory that Jesus is going to hang out with coffee drinkers in heaven, but that's a different. (laughs) But uh, maybe that's how you started your day today. But the reality is that there are so many kinds of love, and we use the word to mean something different, right? Right? So many of these meanings are distorted by our human experiences. They're based on perhaps our upbringing. They're based on how we saw it demonstrated at home or how we watched our neighbor do it and how, how our parents or our grandparents did it, how we do it at church. That Those experiences sometimes have distorted our correct view of love. But as we dive deeper into one of God's attributes, which which is love, when when we look at God's love this morning, I want you to be open, to be expectant of your view being challenged and that you would grow to know Him and also to know how much He loves you. I pray you will be able to see without distortion. As much as we possibly can, how much God loves you. I am certain you will be amazed at at how He loves you and His love for you is much greater and it's much better than any other kind of love. So let's turn to John, 1 John chapter 4. Not the Gospel of John. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4. We will read starting in verse uh, 7. And you can follow on your Bibles, you can follow on your devices, but you can also follow along on the screen behind me. 1 John chapter 4, starting on verse 7, says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. God's love is unique. It's different than any other kind of love. And and 1 John here is saying that we cannot say we love God and not love others. God loves us because it's the essence of who He is, right? He is love, and His love for you is better than your spouse's. His love for you is better than your parents, better than your children. It's better than your friends. The Greek word for God's love is the word agape. And and one commentator defines agape this way. It says agape 
is called out of one's heart by the preciousness of the object loved. It is a love of esteem, of evaluation. It has the idea of prizing. It is not kindled by the merit or worth of its object, but it originates in its own God-given nature. Agape delights in giving, and it keeps on loving, even when the loved one is unresponsive, unkind, unlovable, unworthy. And I want you to pause here for a moment. And I want you to hear this one more time. Agape love, the kind of love that God has for us, is not based on your accomplishments. It says that agape love, the kind of love that God has for you, delights in giving and it keeps on loving when, when you is unresponsive, when you are unkind, when you are unlovable, and when you are unworthy. I mean, can you just be appreciative of how much God loves us this morning that is regardless of how we give and what we give to Him in response? It says it's a consuming passion for the well-being of others. No matter where you are in your journey, Perhaps you have been unresponsive. Perhaps you have been unkind. Maybe you have met someone that has caused you, I guess, to be unlovable. And, and maybe you will feel unworthy. God's love for you delights in giving and it keeps on loving even when you might be going through one of those. It's a consuming passion for the well-being of others. God's agape love is not provoked. It's not convinced. You can't earn it. You can't provoke God, cause Him to love you more. It is not earned. It is an unconditional kind of love that isn't altered by your successes or your mistakes. Have you ever stopped to think of that? God does not love you more today because you're here. And he does not love you less because you missed last week. God will not love you more ne tomorrow if you do everything we're going to talk about here. Because God's love for you is unconditional. It doesn't change. It's the essence of who he is. God loves you because he is love and he loves you unconditionally. And that's great news for us. It doesn't give us permission to go and make mistakes after mistakes because there are consequences to our sins. But it means for us that we can be assured that God loves you. He, he loves me because of who he is. As the source of God, the source of love himself, God loves us not because of who we are, but because of who he is. So similarly to the previous weeks, what I want to do this morning is to look at how God's love has been revealed. We looked at that uh, when we studied the, the other attributes and how we, sh we ought to respond to God's love. What, how has God's love been revealed and how we should respond to it? First, God's love has been revealed through providence. What does that mean? Providence, God's providence means that, that nothing in the world... Okay, say nothing. nothing. Come on, let's say nothing. nothing. Nothing in the world happens outside God's control. Nothing in the world, nothing in your life, nothing in your family circumstances, nothing in the family that is living far away or close by, nothing in the world happens outside His control. He provides what is needed. Again, this is based on God's perfect and permissive will. He provides what is needed in order to accomplish His purposes. So whatever it is that you're facing today or you faced in your life or you will face in the future, God provides what is needed through His permissive and perfect will to accomplish His purposes. God's providential love is demonstrated throughout scriptures. You can find page after page that God is, is, is providing. He's, he's, he's finding a way to, to show people, to draw people, to, to let them know of his love. God's providential love is demonstrated throughout the different seasons of our lives. I'm sure if I were to ask, you would 
have a, uh, an example to give of how God providentially let some things happen or circumstances so that you would, you would understand and feel and, 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 and embrace His love for you. I love Matthew 6, 25. It says this, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. It's, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? It says, verse 26, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than them? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Here the passage is saying that God is a God who loves us. And his providential love will take care of our future. It will take care of every detail of our lives. God's love for us is such that he promises to provide for all of our needs. And His providential love should cause us to turn our anxiety, to turn our fears regarding the future over to Him and trust that He is indeed working all things together. Every circumstance in His perfect timing, He is working all things together for the good of those who love Him and ultimately for His glory. So if you're here today wondering... Why are you going through the things you're going through? I want to remind you this morning that God's providential love for us is such that He promises to provide for all of our needs. He is working all things together. If you love Him, He's working and and shaping and orchestrating the details of your life so that you can turn your anxiety and fears to Him and trust that He is a God who loves you. Years ago, I was uh, a part of a ministry to the homeless downtown Sao Paulo, and I and I and I I loved going every Friday night at at, at eleven o'clock. We would go. We would collect clothes, winter clothes, uh, coats, and and shoes, and and then make hot chocolate and bring bread to a particular area downtown Sao Paulo. We would drive, park the car, and then we'll go and and feed. I mean, give some food to the homeless people there, and and then give them clothes and, um, and blankets. And, and I did that for, for a good amount of time. Every Friday night I would go and come home and, and kind of just see what, what brokenness uh, looked like and how much uh, people needed uh, to encounter God's love like I had. And one of these uh, nights I, I, I met Mr. Real. And uh, I remember he was sitting on the corner. It was about time for us to leave, maybe 2.30 in the morning. And, and I thought, well, there's one more person. I still have one more thing I can give. So, so I went and I, and I met him. And as we were talking, he told me his story. He told me a little bit of the story of his life and how he had become um, uh, addicted to alcohol and that uh, eventually led him to leave his family. And, and he missed them. He had two daughters. And he said, my wife doesn't know where I am. And she's probably very concerned about me. So he said, can you give her a call and let her know that I am okay? And tell her that I love her and I love my daughters. And I thought, yeah, come on. You don't even remember anything of your phone number. I mean, this is just another story I'm hearing. I said, sure. And uh, so I took his phone number and uh, gave him what, he, uh, what I had for him. We prayed before I left, and, and just out of curiosity, I decided to try to call on Monday, and it was the right number. It was a long number, out of state, and I called, and I talked to the wife, and she was telling me how, 
how, how great of a man he was, and, and he loved his family, and they didn't know where he was. They were concerned about him, so I assured them they were okay. And I, and I said, how can we, how can I, is there anything we can do? And so she put me in contact with a brother that was closer to him. And I found the guy, and uh, we um, connected. He said, I want to help my brother. We found a, a, a rehab to send him to. So uh, a couple weeks later, I'm meeting the brother of this homeless man at the bus station, who I had no idea what he looked like. I just had a sign. I went with my dad. I had a sign that had the name of the person. And, and I met him, and, and we went downtown looking for a homeless guy that we had no idea where he lived. So we just went, hey, do you know Mr. Real? And I, I think he's that way. So we, we kind of, so we, this is like during the middle of the day, downtown Sao Paulo. And you have to understand what that means. It's just a, a huge place. I mean, there's chances were very slim of us finding Mr. Real that day. But we did. They pointed us in the right direction, and we went, and, and we found him, and he reconnected with his brother that he had seen in years. And, and they talked about, yes, he wanted to get better, and we put him in the car, we drove to this rehab, and we put him there. I don't know the rest of the story. I'm not sure where he is today. I don't know how much of all of that happens to him that night and, and, and that day when he met his brother. I don't know what that cause but but I know that for him God's love was clearly demonstrated by his providence he had met with me at the right place at the right time at 2 30 in the morning on a Friday night and he wanted him to know how he was loved and cared for he provided him with an opportunity for a new beginning. And he oftentimes works in a similar way in our lives, doesn't he? God's providence draws us to him. So don't disregard what you were going through because God's providence, his providential love is causing you to turn and to watch and to see him for who he really is. God's providence increases our faith and our dependence on Him. It's when you know that you know that you couldn't have happened if God didn't intervene. It had to be God. It exposes our human inadequacy and it highlights God's sovereignty. God's love is also revealed through discipline. And every time I have to discipline my kids, I... I tell, him, I tell them why. I explain to them, this is what you did. This is why you're, you're being disciplined. And my heart breaks to watch their behavior. Maybe after being disciplined, not long after that, they do it again. And I go, why did you do it again? My heart breaks to have to do that. But I know how harmful it can be, not only for today, but for them in the future, if that behavior doesn't change. The patterns they're going and they're creating will affect their life. So, so we do it with love. My love for them does not, is not lessened because of the mistakes they make. So Isabel and I, as limited, as imperfect as we are, we can love them through discipline. We can demonstrate how we love our kids through discipline. Well, like, uh, likewise, God reveals love through discipline, but he does it perfectly. Sometimes Isabel and I blew it, many times. But God does it perfectly. God dis disciplines the ones he loves, and he does it perfectly. Look at Hebrews 12. It says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Nor be weary when we proved by him. Why? Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. I'd much rather be disciplined than left alone. Because God disciplines the one he loves. And chastises every son whom he receives. God cares enough to confront us, to correct us. 
and to allow us to go through consequences of our actions. He uses the appropriate discipline in the appropriate amount at the right time to express His concern. He does it because He loves us. His love is revealed through discipline. And He does it perfectly in love. And then God reveals His love through Jesus Christ. God's ultimate expression of love was revealed through His Son. In fact, Scriptures speak of Jesus as being the exact representation of all of God's attributes. Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus is the radiance of of the glory of God and, and the exact imprint of God's nature. In other words, if you want to know God for who, for who He really is, if you want to not have a distorted view of God and His attributes, if you want to see God for who He really is, to see the real God, I encourage you to wholeheartedly pursue Jesus. Because Jesus is the exact representation of who God is. You can't see God, but Jesus lived on this earth and he pointed through his living and dying and and rising and resurrection. He pointed us to the Father. So if you want to see God, if you want to understand God's attributes deeply, I invite you to search scriptures and to pursue Christ. Jesus demonstrated perfectly the depth and the width of God's love by coming to this earth, and and he modeled his love by the way he lived his life. He poured his life into disciples. He he touched the rejected. He healed the broken. He saved the lost by giving his life as a ransom for many. Now, John 3.16 that Andre opened the, the, the service with this morning is a perfect demonstration of agape love. Of God's sacrificial and unconditional love for us. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So what did we do to deserve it? Did we have to have it all together? Is it based on your upbringing or your family of origin? Was it a result of good behavior or the next song that you're going to write? Is it based on high performance? You got it right. Three out of five. Yes, I got it. Absolutely not. Paul says, if you read a little more, uh, go to Romans 5, that Christ's death on the cross was solely based on the Father's perfect love for us. Let me say it again. Christ's death on the cross was solely based on the Father's perfect love for us. Romans 5 says this, For while we were still weak, didn't have it all together, broken, Christ, at the right time, died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still, what? Sinners, Christ died for us. While you still did not have it all together, while you were still were unkind, unworthy, unresponsive, while we were still sinners, God died. Christ died for us on that cross. And agape love then is demonstrated by the way God sacrificially and unconditionally gave. He gave His only Son, one and only Son, to die on the cross. So that if you believe Him, if you believe in Jesus, you will not perish but have eternal life. So God's love is revealed to us, revealed to us through providence. It's revealed to us through discipline and through Jesus Christ. Now, how do we respond to his love? We must personally 
receive it. Okay, how do you respond to God's love? You've got to receive it. How do you do it? By faith, you can receive God's love into your hearts and have access to his gift of eternal life. By faith, you receive it. We saw it. It's not based on your accomplishment. You can't earn it. It's by faith you receive God's love and have access to his free gift of eternal life. It's a free gift, but you have to receive it in order for it to be yours. You have to receive it. I went to a conference uh, at the orchard on Friday, and before the night was over, we were told that they were going to give everyone in the room a free gift. But the gift had to be picked up downstairs at the bookstore. So it was a free gift, but we had to go pick it up. And it was already late. So some people, like including myself and the pastor that I went to the conference with, we went downstairs, we, we beat the line, and we got our free gift. But some people, they said no to the gift. They declined it, and they went straight home. They didn't want to go pick it up. It was free. They had left over. It was free, but they didn't want to pick it up. In the same way, we all have a choice to either receive it or reject God's love and his gift of salvation. We have a choice. Most of us here in this room, our followers of Christ, have made that decision. But it is a choice. It, it is not just granted by inheritance. My dad is a pastor. My grandfather was a pastor. I didn't just... Okay, I inherited that, and now I got a free gift because they had it. No, it a, it's a free gift. I had to personally receive it. John 3, 17 and 18 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. He says, whoever what? Believes. So you have to believe by faith. You have to believe in him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe, if you reject the free gift, if you reject it, that's condemnation coming. Because he has not believed in the, in the name of the only Son of God. So Jesus bridges the chasm of sin that separates us from God. Performance, I said it before, performance won't do it, okay? Good works detached from faith in Christ are insufficient. Eternal life, God's free gift of eternal life, receiving God's love for us, are not inherited by being good or by simply following a religion. If I look at your attendance over the past six months, if you haven't missed any Sunday, it's not going to do it. Not going to work. It won't work. Our performance won't grant us access to God's free gift of eternal life. Let me try to illustrate this, th th this, this idea for you this way. If you've ever traveled overseas to another country, chances are that you had to apply for a visa, right? You had to have a visa. My sister is planning on coming to visit my family, spend some time with us over Christmas. And we haven't purchased her tickets yet because her 10-month-old son needs to have a visa to come here to the States. So we're waiting for scheduling an appointment. She has to go. We have to fill out paperwork. And he has to have a visa, a stamp on his passport that lets him come in. So a visa is, is that, that stamp that allows a non-citizen to enter into another country. In a similar way that a visa is what grants you access to another country, Jesus is the only way, he is the only way by which we can have eternal life. Jesus is the only way. The sure hope of eternal life, the, the exceeding peace that Christ gives, the abiding joy of, of knowing that you have been made right before God only comes to those who have surrendered their lives and opened their hearts to receive God's gift of the Savior. 
Jesus is the only way. He is the truth. He is the life. Those who believe in him will be saved. How do you respond to God's love? You have to receive it. Believe. And then you have to give it to others. Give it to others. This is John 13. It says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So it's saying that you receive it. You are delighting in the fact that God loves you and loves you unconditionally. And you don't just go home and sit and wait for the time that God will take you home to your eternal home. You have to give it to others. You have to share the love, right? You have to give it. You have to spread it. There are many people around us that have never experienced such kind and, and just and, and perfect love as we have. There are people in our families and people that you go to work with and, 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 and people that you, you meet in the grocery store. People are, are, are asking questions, not knowing. And, and we are the ones who have to tell them of how we have been absolutely amazed, overwhelmed by God's love. We have to give it. Love one another. This is specifically to to us as believers in Christ. He's saying, hey, you got to love one another. Okay, not just, hey, love your bro. It's, it's, it's more than that. What kind of love is that? How do we have to do it? What kind of love is, are, are we supposed to demonstrate toward one another? It says is in, in, in 1 Corinthians, it says that love is what? It's patient. Okay, it's a love that is patient and kind. I'm going to ask you, have you loved someone this way this week? Patient and kind, a love that does not envy. You are, you are excited and celebrating what God is doing in someone's life, even if you were not the one who got it. You love them, and you are excited and happy for them. It does not insist on its own way. It, it is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. We are called to love one another that way. How should I love one another? Just go to 1 Corinthians 13 before you leave home tomorrow. And this is your goal. God, give me the ability, the opportunity, the strength, the, 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 the grace to love this way. And it's not going to be perfect. It wasn't perfect for me yesterday. It won't be perfect for me today. But I am going to try the best I can and strive to love the way that we are commanded to love. Why? Because the world is watching. And by the way we love each other, people will know that we are God's disciples. People will be introduced to God's love by the way they see us loving one another. Those of us who have received and believe God's love ought to respond by giving it, giving it away to others. I guarantee it. You won't run out. Okay, there's a lot more that he can give and he will continue to fill. You just have to give and he will continue to fill because he is love himself. It's the essence of who he is. He is the source, the provider of love. So don't hold back, but give it. Give it away. Give it away to others. We ought to love how authentically, genuinely, a first Corinthians 13 kind of love. It's more than just being nice and ending a conversation after you've talked for 15 minutes. You get, love you, brother. It's more than that. It's deeper than that. It has to cost you something. It's more than just being nice. It's sacrificial. And love has hands and feet. It had when Jesus come. It has to have when he sends us. It has to be demonstrated in the way we live. And if we love that way, we are reflecting God's love. 
We are identifying ourselves as disciples of Jesus and we are ultimately pointing others to him. Let me end with this. Since my boys were little, I, um, I oftentimes told them that I loved them. Many times during the day when I got home and before putting them to sleep, I said, hey, Caleb, I love you. Isaac, I love you. But I also asked the question. It was kind of a silly question. I said, hey, Bunny, how much does, how much does Daddy love you? How much, how much does Daddy love you? A little or a lot? And they would stretch out their arms, stretch out their arms like this. And they would say, Daddy, you love me this much. And that's all they could do. This is as far as they could go. I said, you, you love me a lot. You, you, you love me this much. And then Anna came along, and, and I also oftentimes tell her that she is loved. My little princess, she is loved. But I would ask the same questions. Hey, Anna, how much does Daddy love you? And she would say, you love me the size of 10 airplanes. <laughs> It's the size of 10 airplanes. And what she meant by that was that I loved her a lot. She couldn't really understand the size of it. I just loved her a lot. It's the size of 10 airplanes. She knows I do. And this morning we have seen how God's love has indeed been revealed through his providential love, his providence, his discipline, and, and through Jesus Christ. But perhaps some in this room needed to be reminded of God's love for you personally. You came in not really knowing or, or maybe not hearing or sensing or feeling or, or maybe you're doubting or maybe your circumstances are, are kind of hindering you from seeing and you needed to be reminded this morning of God's love for you, His perfect love for you. Maybe some... Needed to hear it for the first time. That's not what you grew up with. You, you, you really didn't know that. You never heard that before, perhaps. Maybe never fully comprehended. And how much does God the Father love you? I can say with confidence that He definitely loves you more than this much. And he loves you more than 10 airplanes. God's love is greater, more encompassing. It's, it's, it's bigger, more perfect than any other kind of love. It's the agape love that delights in giving and keeps on giving and keeps on loving even when we are undeserving. So I want you to leave this place confident in the fact that neither death nor life nor angels or rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor heights nor depth nor anything in creation, nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Would you stand with me to pray?